Welcome to Return on Podcast, where we talk about the experiences, the obsessions, and the habits of the most successful e-commerce entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Tyler Jeffcoat, and I want to welcome you to this episode of ROP. Today, I want to get inside the mind of Amazon. Strange, twisted as it might be, I want to try to get inside Amazon's mind. FBA fees have increased twice already, about to increase a third time here in the middle of 2022. Amazon's plan to launch new fulfillment centers across the nation has been ratcheted back. And I uh, had a friend tell me yesterday, maybe got scrapped last month, which is creating tremendous pressure on inventory levels for a lot of our clients here at Seller Accountant. And in spite of these challenges, Amazon is still not just a, but the crucial business partner for probably 75, 80% of the customers here at Seller Accountant. And so we got to figure out how to work with them, even when things are tough for them. And so today I want to get into their mind. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what's happening with strategy within Amazon. And to have this discussion, I want to bring in my friend, Stan Friedlander. Hey, Stan, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm having a pretty good day. You're three hours behind me. So it's Sure enough, morning over there on the West Coast. I think you were telling me before we started that literally Amazon's headquarters is within eyesight. So hopefully they won't overhear this discussion too much here, <laughs> Stan. <laughs> but I doubt it. Or you never know with the overlord, but it's all good. <laughs> it is all good, man. Well, so we're going to talk about Amazon strategy, what's evolving, what's happening in the space, how our brands that you and I represent as consultants are having to pivot their thinking. But you also have a complicated history with Amazon because you were one of the executives there for a while. And so I want to I do this with every show, by the way, just a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey. For you, your entrepreneurial journey was, I was an ex-Amazonian that has now launched a consulting practice. And help me if I misquote this here, but I think you were one of the leaders of the apparel line or the apparel category for Amazon. And then you helped them launch the Japanese marketplace. Is that correct? I Yeah, I worked in the US way back when, 2008. And I will say that the apparel business was pretty tiny when I started there. I had actually worked it in brick and mortar for quite a number of years beforehand completely different background. In fact, Amazon tends to hate hiring from offline retail. And uh, when I started there, I think I had six people on my team. And I think the apparel business right now probably has around four to 500 people in the U.S. alone. So I, I ran the apparel business until 2012, the footwear business until 2016. Then I moved to Japan and I didn't launch the business, but I turned it profitable. Let's put it that way. And I lived in Japan for about two and a half years came back to the States and uh, left Amazon after about 10 and a half. And that allowed me to stay married. I actually get that. I I sold my former company, Stan, because that also allowed me to stay married. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to be able to stay married. So just by the way, this is a super side note. I would say less than 10% of our clients at Seller Accountant sell on the Japanese version of the marketplace. Just kind of curious, what is your understanding of what's currently happening over there? Is Amazon really getting traction in that marketplace or is it stalled out? What's your understanding of the viability of the Japanese? Uh, No, it's actually, it is still growing. I mean, obviously I'm not there anymore and can't speak to true growth or true numbers, but I know it's still growing. And actually I would argue relative to the two largest competitors, three largest competitors in the online world of Japan happen to be Yodabashi, Rakuten and Zozo Town. And my guess is that this audience probably hasn't heard of two of the three and maybe has heard of Rakuten since that's the largest in Japan and they've branched out elsewhere. But Amazon is growing faster than them over the last uh, number of years, especially during COVID is my understanding. And that's continued to be the, the case. Japan went through a different sort of COVID than the rest of us. They shut down somewhat more willingly. That's the way that the culture might work. And that actually could have helped online even more than it did, but everybody has its own set of challenges. But yeah, Amazon Debt JP is certainly something folks should look at, but it's not to be taken lightly as, okay, you just copy paste whatever the heck you're doing in other countries. Not that simple. And hopefully I have run into clients before that think you can just copy and paste and language is certainly a barrier. Cultural selling norms are certainly barriers and you need to understand those things before you just jump. You know, and the topic of this podcast is not necessarily Japan, but I think since we have you here, just yeah. one more pulling that thread a little bit more, maybe you're an average million dollar brand. You're very viable in America and you think there may be some potential in Japan. What are your kind of top nuggets for, uh, you've just mentioned a couple, by the way, probably hire someone that understands Japanese language and culture. That's two really important ones. What are some of those other, this is what's going to make you successful or make this a complete waste of your time getting into the Japanese marketplace? If you can find out your own search ranking data 
before you even do anything. Obviously spend as little as possible to get that data if you can. And understanding what you're, are you even heard of over there? Is your product a commodity over there or are you a commodity based or do you have something special? And then, yeah, once you've gotten somewhat general sense of those sorts of things, do you have any sort of viability? Yeah, it's worth hiring at least a, I'm not necessarily saying me because I can't speak Japanese, but Hiring somebody to do your translation and don't just assume Google Translate because I have had clients do that and think that's good enough and absolutely not, especially when you get outside romance languages, it's pretty bad and you'll just, you'll kill yourself before you get anywhere on the Japanese site. On that same being said though, is can overseas sellers sell in the Japan platform? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other thing, and we may talk about this as well, but diversify. Don't just assume Amazon's it. Right? Rocket 10 is essentially a marketplace. And if you happen to sell apparel or footwear, Zozo Town is a marketplace. And Yodabashi isn't like they're a marketplace model. They're actually not how the US is set up. So there are other marketplaces you can go to that if you can figure out Amazon, you should be able to figure out the others. But I think what's encouraging about that is I hadn't thought about it that way. If I'm going to uh, here's what I'm hearing is I'm trying to restate what you said there. Don't half-ass it. If you're going to go into Japan, do it right. And make sure yeah. you actually do the real translation, build real listings, understand the context of your listing and your keyword ranking and that kind of thing. But if you're going to invest those additional resources in a potentially successful launch in Japan, it's encouraging to know that some of those resources could also be deployed to capture more of the Japanese market through these other marketplace options. And I would almost argue because of how much I don't want to call it, it's cultural overhead that would have to be bitten off in order to get into that market. You're probably doing yourself a disservice not to go ahead and launch listings on those other platforms as well so that you can mm -hmm. recycle that same, you've spent that 20 grand to have somebody really dig in and build these listings that are in Japanese that understand the market, whatever you have to spend. Let's mm -hmm. use that 20 grand across three different marketplaces instead of just that's Amazon, right. because then our learning and investment carries us further. So I think that's pretty sound advice there. Anything else about Japan before we pivot to the main Amazon here in the States for most of our sellers? Same day delivery is not that hard. <laughs> so <laughs> don't assume that you're going to do your own shipping. I doubt sincerely most sellers would jump in thinking that they could do that. But when you start hearing about, oh, there's fees for same day, that's the norm. Amazon is same day if you buy before nine o'clock. The others typically next day. Well, that's the competing environment, but that's the same is mm. true in UK and DE as well. So just keep that in mind is that as you think about Japan or some of these other market segments is that it may seem like it's a ridiculous price to pay in the U S it's not so ridiculous in other countries. Got it. That actually is really interesting that again, that should inform our strategy. Hey, just know that the buyer expectation in Japan is the same as it is in the UK and in, in Germany. Yep. And that same day or next morning kind of delivery, which by the way, this is like funny as a consumer, we buy a lot on Amazon prime. I'm a guilty, complete Amazon nut as a purchaser. I feel like we've had increased lead times in general over the past two to three weeks. We bought a bunch of stuff as we moved into this new office and our user, it's amazing how quickly, this is to your point there, Stan, it's amazing how quickly I get frustrated at five day delivery now. Yeah, It's like, what is going on here guys? And just understand guys, as you try to build out your infrastructure and logistics in a country like Japan, that expectation is there and you need to be engineered and probably have enough stock or have it to where Amazon can fulfill that promise. So interesting. So, okay, broadening out, think about Amazon in general here, Stan, what are you learning this year about working with Amazon that's impacting the strategy of the customers that you serve? I think that you're seeing, and especially if you pay attention to public announcements and stock price and whatnot, is you're seeing a slowdown. I think the slowdown for Amazon is maybe 12 months later than what you've seen in other online retail. In the, and I'm speaking U.S. in particular, in that Amazon certainly benefited in 2020. They continued to benefit in 2021, whereas some other online retail, not so much. And I think what you're seeing in 2022 is the not so much of 2021 is a hangover effect maybe for Amazon. And, and that's, I guess my way of saying is I don't see this as a true long term that in 12 months, are they still going to be facing the, maybe the same sort of if everybody's down 10, they're down 10 type of thing. No, I just think that they had a, a, a longer time frame of the benefit 
and now you're just seeing them anniversary that longer time frame of the benefit that's somewhat being nice maybe to my former employer but that then there ha has a sort of a hangover effect not to keep using that term to sellers and to the balance of vendors and sellers that use amazon in that, okay, you've got someone that's, I don't want to say they're panicking, but they're, they're reacting. Business isn't as good as we thought it would be. And how, what do we do about it? So you have one, the potentially increased FBA fees, demand forecasting is coming down more so than what you thought. I think what you're also seeing is your ability to argue your case. You don't agree with the demand forecast. You file a case or you try to prove via math that you're right, they're wrong. And that's becoming likely harder for most folks, I'm guessing. And sometimes this is some of the things that I help with. And I'm also seeing instances, and now we're talking somewhat strategically internally at Amazon, is that you might see Amazon figure ways of promoting its own 1P, figure ways of talking about exclusives, which is another way of talking about private labor. So for those that sell products that are very commoditized, yeah, you, you clearly have to be careful. You know, you mm -hmm. clearly have to wonder how long does it have to be before Amazon just does this as well. If you're okay. doing one to 500,000 a year on Amazon, is Amazon going to care and do a private label? No. But if you have one SKU that happens to do three to 5 million, you might want to worry yeah. about how easy is that SKU to replicate? Even if you have a great supply chain, even if you have a great factory and you own the, own the factory, I'd be careful. I'd wonder how long you can do that with a limited SKU count. Those are the types of things that I'm seeing that Amazon strategically, especially anytime they, they have a slowdown, as you see this, how do we grow our 1P in a fair way? I'll mm -hmm. use that as a wink. And how do we make sure that we're still priced competitively for those that certainly sellers control their own pricing, but they may feel pressure sometimes that they are not, they may feel like they're getting nudged more often that mm -hmm. they're not as competitive. And I will say is that Amazon is certainly watching that more than ever. What's well, really interesting. So you're articulating some of the challenges of kind of 1P sellers, and we'll talk a little bit more about 1P versus 3P, I think here in a minute. But as we're on this quest, Stan and I are here to think inside Amazon's mind, you mentioned two things there. I want to, I want to say, we don't know, Stan and I don't know what's going to happen with Amazon. I loved your thoughts on there's Amazon was dominant enough in the market that they're behind the curb. They survived the curb longer. First thing you mentioned that I think is really fascinating as our listeners build their strategy for the next six months, getting into the beginning of 2023 is Amazon had to post a couple of consecutive quarters of massive losses to put the brakes on. I was realizing this talking to a CFO client this morning, Stan. The reality is that our business models, especially for three P sellers that are in my portfolio, we were more profit. It, we didn't get as much bad news as we should have back in first quarter. What I mean by that is demand was depressed. We did overbuy inventory for last fall, thinking that Q4 was going to be as big as Q4 in 2020, and it wasn't. But Amazon propped us up because they weren't increasing FBA fees as quickly as they should have to keep their shareholders happy. And they were still making massive capital investments in the new FCs. The evidence that we're seeing in the last couple of weeks is that Amazon is finally having to wake up and kind of, it's not a humble pie thing. It's just they're having to react decisively to the market changes. And the impact on that is going to be an increased pressure on our profit margins as sellers. And then, so that lag thing is something, guys, keep that in mind. That's going to not stop. The other part of that I think is important to remember is that you and I were not the only ones to overbuy our products for last Q4 and for Q1. Amazon did too. And so Stan's talking about this private label 1P Amazon, <laughs> the, the Amazon Basics batteries that I have in my house right now. Amazon's sitting on an extra 60 days of that product, just like you are. And as a result, there's an increased wink incentive for Amazon to prioritize the movement of their own overstocked product over helping the poor little 3P guy out there that's trying to get his product to move. And that's just something to keep in mind as you're ordering and as you're driving your strategy. And this kind of goes back to the first thing you said, Stan, diversification is probably a good strategy in general because given the choice to help you make money or help Amazon make money, Amazon's always going to choose Amazon. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. And actually I should probably say this ahead of the diversification comments. I don't own a single stock in Amazon and I don't own a single stock in any other retailer right now, just FYI. But I would argue it's one of the first things I say. So the types of different services I offer is when I talk to clients and I'm giving them like the 50,000 foot overview discussion and strategic thinking, which is some of what I do. 
is talking about organic search one and two talking about diversity. I know my, most all of my background that most people see is Amazon, but I did also work at offline retail department store retail. It's the first thing that I tend to argue with, especially with sellers is be very careful that you have hundred percent of your business with one person, even if it's good, that one person still drives your cost structure. And to the whole point of FBA fees going up and maybe they were late. You know, I might argue if I'm Amazon, if I raise those fees, let's say last Q4, and I'm one of the only retailers that's announcing sales are still double digits, profits are going up. I just announced a 20 for one stock split. I can guarantee you that one of the biggest topics internally is antitrust. Yeah. And so they constantly are balancing this. Do we have some sort of offset or argument? Two consecutive quarters of depressed sales. I might argue there's also an overinvestment in FCs, but you can hide a lot of cost in that. And therefore they can now say, hey, look, we can raise fees because we have to. It's harder for a regulator to, for attorney generals to go after them and say, you're just predatory. You're getting away with this because you can. There may be some truth to that, but there is a reality too. They also look, if we're losing money, we have to make money. That's free. No, it's right. There's a PR part of this that I wasn't really thinking about. And you can't do a 20 to one stock split and increase FBA fees by 8% in the same month. Like, I get that. I hadn't really thought yeah. about it, but that's a really good point. And so that tends to see, that's why sometimes you may see these lagging when Amazon does something that seems very, I, mean, I, I don't know that I'd say raising fees is necessarily draconian. It's you're making money. What, but. What I would argue is draconian is if in 2020, let's say they're increasing sales 60% because of a worldwide pandemic. And then they announce, guess what? We're going to raise our merchant fees from 15 to 17 to 19. Yeah. That's not going to go over too well with regulators. And they do most every large decision like that. They're going to, they're going to factor in how, what's the optics of this. And so that is all, I mean, it's always a topic of discussion internally. I want to talk about 1P versus 3P. The one thing you mentioned a minute ago that I just want to remind people of, we talk about this a lot on the podcast, by the way, here, Stan, is that things were really irrational a year ago because of how high multiples were to buy these Amazon only businesses. And the advice that you just gave about being careful to diversify was largely ignored by the market, probably from beginning of the pandemic until maybe the end of last year. And the reason was, is that the private equity markets were paying higher multiples for a single channel, four to five SKU brand. They didn't want the complexity. They weren't ready to integrate the operational complexity of having these other marketplaces up and running or having a direct consumer strategy or a bricks and mortar strategy. This is just a reminder, guys, that listen to the show a lot. This is a win for common sense because what Stan said would always pass the common sense test. Let's make sure we have multiple streams of revenue and let's make sure that we're not completely beholden to one seller of our product, Amazon being the seller. And yet we had some irrational swing over the last 24 months that's reverting back to common sense. And so just here's what that means. Because of what I understand about the capital markets, probably not a good time to sell your business because of what's happening in the capital venture capital world. Now's the time to probably invest if you have capital yourself, if you're flush, if you have some cash on the balance sheet. Now's time to invest in the expansion into other markets, whether that's UK, Deutsch, or Japan, like we were talking about with an Amazon, or whether it's time to finally hire influencers and get your direct to consumer marketing strategy up and running. 2022 is probably a year for that kind of infrastructure investment so that we don't have to be surprised by an 8% increase in Amazon fees because we've got five different streams of income, like that kind of thing. Yeah, Stan, if you have any other comments about that, feel free to add them. But I want to talk about this 1P versus 3P strategy. What is the, what's the cutting edge of that discussion right now with your clients, the brands that are really deciding whether to be 1P, 3P or both with Amazon? What do you got on that? I hate to tell you that it's an, it depends, but there is a reality too of when I'm talking to clients, I want to better understand. So what are you selling? What is your current distribution? And walk that line of, and as you mentioned, the diversification I'm looking at is how easy, hard, whatever you want to call it, for you to suddenly create it. Let's say you're hundred percent on Amazon selling a commodity business, and you may be okay with that declining even let's say 5% per year for the next 20 years of your life, let's say, but most people that might seem okay to them. But what if I said that's oh, interesting. I admit, I don't like accepting declines, but that's interesting, but let's say it's 5% for two years and suddenly it was everything. Suddenly you went to zero and no one's even telling you why, and you can't get a why from 
the one person you, with whom you do business. And I'm just, I'm saying these things because I've experienced it. I'm not saying me personally, but I have clients who have that. And yeah, there's certainly recourses, but does everyone really want to go through those recourses? You probably don't. Finding me is probably the furthest recourse you, you want to have to do going to the press or legal and those sort of things. Those should be last ditch efforts, but let's not kid ourselves. Amazon does force that at times. If you have your own D to C that does 10 to 20% of your total. I can guarantee you, you look more attractive to somebody else at that point. If you can get somehow Walmart or eBay or whoever, an Etsy, depending on what types of products you sell to be 10 to 20%, and you get your own D to C to be 10 to 20%, suddenly you look that much more attractive. That's, it's just a reality. And it's to your point, Tyler, that, you know, over a 24 month period at one time, what did the aggregators or the larger aggregators look like to the market? And then what do they look like today? Those two have gone through an evolution. What do, what does the market think of? And when I say the market, I mean the stock market. What do they, what do they think of people like a Shopify today versus 12 to 18 months ago? And mind you, again, I don't own stock in any of these. It's just something to think about as to if you took a long-term approach to all of this, and if you took a step back and what would you do if you were advising yourself? And it may be even finance 101 or investing 101, but that is a reality of how do you think in terms of being dependent on one person, a hundred percent of your sales, you'd probably say that's stupid. So what would you need to invest to get up to five or 10% of D to C? And even if you said, well, that's, I just don't have that capital right now. Okay. If you could have that capital in the next year or two versus just doing a copy and paste. And then that got you 1% of your, was your D to C I'd say you're probably still, you'd argue to yourself, oh yeah, investing 101 would say I should go ahead and invest it today to get to the 10 to 20% level. Even mm -hmm. if that hurt, even if I thought I was going into, and I'm sorry to say the R word a recession. And yes, I'm a pretty big pro proponent of the diversification. I'm a pretty big proponent of figuring out how to keep your model on Amazon whole, keep your competing, your, whatever you're selling as competitively and understanding that where you are today, Amazon may not allow that in the future. They may, they are always trying to create competition and mind you, they can be a competitor as well. And so what is that discussion? Cause so many things came into my mind as you were talking there, Stan, but how does that discussion inform specifically the vendor versus seller relationship? So if I'm trying to decide for those of you guys who listen to the show, you like, yeah, some sellers out there don't even know that people used to sell on one P right. There's still, there's an entire population of new age, private label sellers that know only seller central have never even logged into a vendor central account before. If you're coaching a brand, I know it depends. You said it depends. What are some of those things that might strategically mark brand A as being, if it depends on this, probably you need to stick with 1P as your primary Amazon partnership. If you look like this, or if this is what your goal is, then probably 3P is the way to go. Do you have any anecdotes on that front? Yeah, I would look at it as from two things and I'm hating, I know I'm about to sound Amazonian in this regard, but one is to think about it from how your customer thinks about it and work backward from that. And I know that's direct quoting from how Amazon would think, but I, I worked there for 10 and a half years. So I do believe in the secret sauce. So I do believe in who is, who is your customer, who is your next new customer so that they're just beyond who you've gotten so far, but you better damn well understand who is your customer right now and who is just beyond that. And how are you reaching that customer today? And that's one way to think. The other way to think in an other way concurrently is thinking on how does Amazon view this whole situation? And I know this is where I would say, I think most sellers and even brands just think Amazon's just trying to make money or Amazon's just whatever. And I would say, eh, take a step back from that. What does Amazon care about more than anything? And actually they do care about the customer experience, yeah. period, end of story. In Amazon's perfect world, they get to control the customer experience from end to end. Now, end to end means private label and sourcing all the way to last mile delivery to the consumer. And look, they're not going to do that in every instance. But I'm, I just gave you strategically, if they could, and they could make money and even just a cent, they don't care necessarily about making boatloads of money per unit they sell. 
That's what they care about is the control of that customer experience. So understanding who your customer is and how you're reaching your customer, but then also understanding where are you in that sort of control pie that mm. Amazon, Amazon would like to control everything. They want to have it in their warehouse. They probably ship better than you can on your own. So look, there's a reason why, you know, the FBA fees. Yeah. But if you did it on your own and tried to get a, a, an item to a customer in one or two business days, it's probably cheaper to still do FBA. And that's why yeah. people do it. That's why Amazon can raise its fees. But understanding that process, it can maybe give you some sense of, okay, they couldn't control the sourcing because of X, Y, or Z. You know that better about your own product than I do. I would learn about it if I was advising, but what other competitors exist in your environment? How do you know Amazon won't create a partnership with them? And if they did, what would you do? And I, and I'm, this is how I think is like, I think about it more from a standpoint of the three to five year out and then working backward, both from how does the customer think about it? But then if Amazon's hundred percent of my distribution, I better damn well understand how does Amazon view me? And no, they don't care about you individually as sellers. Sorry, that's, they don't, but they still have a competitive strategy on how they think through this whole thing. You should have an understanding of where do you fit in that pie and where are the other people that sell similar types of items? Should you branch out? Should you have more products? That's another form of diversification. Do you pay attention to other ASINs that are in your product segment? Are you sure that those other ASINs aren't paying attention to you and not to get too much into the nefarious abuse types of things, but are you paying attention to this stuff? Have you ever read your own reviews on your products? I hope, I hope from, you could probably guess that if that's one of the questions I'm going to ask you. So have you read your one-star reviews recently? Like you, you should, these are the types of things that from a deeper dive, you should better understand. And I can guarantee you, Amazon has algorithms to understand this about you. I love it. So the topic of our episode today is getting in the mind of Amazon. Anything else that you think sellers should hear that Amazon is probably thinking right now that might dictate our moves or our strategy over the next six months? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the six months, but they've announced the buy with Prime. I know people are understanding that last mile has been a big deal for them for quite some time. You can probably start guessing that Amazon is branching out into other things that they've been good at for quite some time in-house, meaning they want everybody, they want all traffic to be on Amazon. They want everything. You know, buy with Prime is a little bit of branching out, is it not? And by the way, do you think Amazon could create a website for people? They probably could. Now, have they offered that as a like true Shopify? No, but could they? I'm just throwing this out of how to, and that's why I said it's more than, it's probably more than six months out. From a standpoint of right now, do I think Buy With Prime is going to expand and be something that's bigger than right now? I'd be shocked if it's not in two to five years. So these would be types of things that I would be looking at yourself is should I be almost be using Amazon as I hate to say consulting solutions provider because they're pretty bad at account management, but they could, I think you could be looking at it from that standpoint at the same time is, are you large enough to start taking some of these things in house? Which is another way, thing. The Shopify thing, Stan, just, I read an updated article on that just last week about Shopify's board has just changed their policy. So buy with prime is now considered a violation of terms of service within Shopify. And it's a direct response to your thought thread that you just had where, oh boy, let's, yes, let's partner with Amazon on this. And then they get six months into the partnership and are like, oh no, we're now driving traffic to Amazon's website and we're giving the gorilla in the room even more power over the value chain. And so my guess is that Amazon's response to what I think they would have to view as an attack from Shopify would logically be to try to launch an AWS version of Shopify that is some cheaper, something. They're going to find some angle to come in at that they I would be shocked if in the next three years we don't see that. I don't know why Amazon hasn't done it already. It's been mentioned in every like book about Amazon for the past 10 years. But I think Shopify has finally realized that we felt like we had to be cozy with Amazon so they didn't try to crush us. And now we're weakened and we're realizing that they are going to crush us regardless. We got to try to distance ourselves from this animal in the room that's maybe going to eat us. 
And I unfortunately am concerned if I were a Shopify shareholder, I would be concerned because of the power that Amazon could potentially wield pretty quickly in that regard. Anything you're learning about communicating with Amazon right now that we should know? I know you do a lot of the, how do you get issues resolved with Amazon? Is there anything that's been helpful to you and your clients in terms of effectively communicating? Well, it, I mean, that's one of the services I offer is essentially how to speak Amazon how to speak Amazonian, understanding that as much as Amazon can come across as the faceless wonder and what do you mean communication matters? Yeah, it does. Strangely, to actually get a human to respond, you have to speak in a certain way, which actually is the way that you're thinking that they don't communicate, meaning they're very emotionless. They're very numerical. So prove your point without emotion. Don't start screaming in an email, which by the way, if you're writing an email, that means you got some sort of contact and Jeff B is not the contact and figuring a way of how does Amazon benefit from whatever you're arguing. And it can't just be because I got turned off. That's not the way to communicate with Amazon. The way to communicate with Amazon is explaining how this is hurting their customer. Cause trust me, they don't view it as your customer on Amazon. They view, and I'll say it is when I ran the footwear business, if a seller somehow found me, let's say, and that was their comment, I can tell you pretty egotistically and very quickly, you've just turned me off because I view it as, no, this is my customer. These are the types of things. Is you, if you are reaching someone, you are reaching a human being and they are very egotistical and they view that they're probably smarter at whatever they're doing than you are. So prove whatever you're doing as to why this is hurting their customer. They're out of stock. The detailed page had information that's wrong. Amazon might've changed it in some way, or some other seller might've changed it in some way. You're competing with sellers. They don't believe you're the brand owner. You know, however you're communicating with them, understand that at the end of the day, what they care about is how is their customer impacted? So when you're communicating, start with the customer. And By the way, Stan, my eight-year-old is amazing at this. My eight-year-old is amazing <laughs> at articulating why it's in my best interest to give her whatever she wants. And what's interesting, and Bonnie has taught me this. Thank you, Bonnie. But if you and view this the same way with Amazon, guys, like if I can forego the need to have the moral victory and actually yes. will choose to do what I have to do to get the result I want. It's kind of like Dr. Phil would you rather be right or happy, right? That kind of thing. Like if you view Amazon that way, which is exactly what you're just saying, Stan, and say, hey, what does, what is it, what, how could I take, because almost any concern with Amazon could be restated in a way that is, their customer would be happier if this happened or my concerns that the customer's experience or like, and so doing, spending the time and kind of, there's a little bit of an ego swallow. And that's why this is a bit of a rope dope strategy actually Stan, is that if I can swallow my ego and come at Amazon from Amazon's side of the table, I'm going to win nine times as many of those cases as if I go through okay. it, trying to either bloody Amazon or blame Amazon or, win a moral victory of saying I'm right and you're wrong. And that kind of intuitively makes sense, but naturally we don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that except my eight year old who intuitively knows how to use her will to get what she wants. But anything else about that? I mean, that makes so much sense other than hire you, by the way, like to, to just, and then the other thing is to think in terms of what numbers do you have that back up your argument and use them and mm -hmm. be right. Don't use numbers that are wrong. Don't tell me numbers that you think are right. And then I find out are wrong and they're already in an email somewhere. You pretty much have just shot. You're going to be, you're going to start over at not just square one. There's a square negative one when Amazon thinks that you're <laughs> trying to pull a wool over them. That's how they, that's how they think. And then the other thing too, is that let's say, and I've had this too, of somebody else in your product segment is doing something wrong and you just want Amazon to do something about it. And so you prove to them, you send them copy, screen copies and all these different things. One is go back to what I just said is how is this hurting Amazon's customers and speak in those terms without emotion and without adjectives. And two, Amazon's not going to tell you, oh my God, we're so happy you told us this. Thank you so much. Number two is not going to happen. Get over it. I might say this was great. I don't work there anymore. Amazon's right. not going to tell you that. So just... Get that out of your thinking of them saying they're sorry, or you were right, I was wrong. Because 98 to 99% of the time, internally, they were right. 
and they already know that ahead of time. Mm-hmm. So just just understand that that if the problem goes away, and it may go away without anyone even telling you. <laughs> So even though no one responds to your email, did you check to make sure is that competitor still there or did that wording on that detailed page that you felt was misleading, did it go away? Then that's your win. And if that doesn't enough for you, then don't pay me (laughs) because really all what you're hiring people or to get solutions is what is the solution you're genuinely looking for? And if you're Mm -hmm. looking for you want me to get you to have Jeff Bezos at your front door. Anyone who's promising that, I'd love them. But so, so Stan, I heard some nuggets there. You're going to communicate with Amazon from their perspective without emotion, using data that is not BS. And then you're going to, I would imagine that the screenshots, uh, you said this without saying it, but make it idiot proof for the human being within Amazon to follow the logic of your argument. Because not only... Like you, you should make it, not only should you be correct, but you should make it incredibly idiot proof for them to go to the data source. Hey, I found this on this report with this date range. So that when well, they do go like, validate. You know, when you're saying that, and I talk to a lot of sellers, you sell five ASINs, you do $3 million. You love this product and you know it inside and out. Yeah. I probably don't, you hired me to, you know, you couldn't get somewhere. That's certain ways I'm hired. I probably don't know your product at all. Right. I have people that'll send me a screenshot and I'm like, looks fine to me. What am I, tell me, what am I looking for? And by the way, you're actually paying me to do this. Now picture you're at Amazon, no offense, probably you filed a case. They're in another country. They're probably getting paid pretty crappy and they probably have an incentive to turn this around in 30 seconds. And you just sent them, this is wrong. You got to take this off their site. Deny. That's the yep. easiest, make it as easy as possible for them to see whatever the problem is that you're talking about. And by the way, they still may deny. And then you have to sometimes find people like me. There is a reality too that Amazon has its own set of problems of how they deal with problem, or, you know, cases, or complaints. But if you're trying to do the best that you can, yeah, make it idiot proof. So resolving issues, you've tried, you're frustrated. You need to hire someone that has the Amazon language and lingo. Uh, Stan, you're one of these consultants that can really help people with that. You're my understanding is you're not like a huge team. It's you. Like you are a guy that really understands Amazon in and out. And my question is, what are the kinds of brands out there? Maybe what are the kinds of concerns that may come up where someone may need to find a way to reach out to you? You have to decide how large this problem is to you. Well, that's for sure. I'm not free. And I know none of my competitors and I don't view what I actually don't view what I do is that it exists much. There's certain things that exist certainly, but If I'm just trying to solve a problem on Amazon and you found me, it's likely that you've gone through some other means too. And it's likely that I'm maybe escalating this internally at Amazon just because I may know where to go. And I also will tell you, and you know, this is something that's tied to this is Amazon is making that even more difficult, even for people like me to get to the right people. They've threatened firing people, you know, for contact information and whatnot that gets outside of Amazon because I for whatever reason, they think they can control a million emails that exist within their system. And also, by the way, some of us are genuinely just trying to solve consumer problems. So you should actually care, but you see how I'm looking at it. I'm actually trying to solve a problem that if I was still there, and these are the types of cases I take, I will only take a case that I, for the information that's provided to me, if I was the category leader for this area, if I was the VP for this area, I'd be like, why haven't we solved this fucking thing? Sorry to swear. And that's, I view that's how people internally at Amazon should be. So I take it with that same passion of you should care about this. Where do I go with it? And that's, I will just say is that's becoming interestingly harder as Amazon's becoming more and more bureaucratic, quite frankly. Makes sense. That's actually, that's a nice pin in the discussion is if you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing and it isn't in Amazon or their customer's best interest, to solve this problem, then you're probably not going to get very far with Stan or anyone else. But if the concern is legitimate and you're frustrated, which does happen, by the way, Stan, what's a good way for people to reach out to you if they wanted to learn more about getting your help with a hairy problem? Actually, just my email, which is my name. So FriedlanderStan at gmail.com spelled exactly how it is on the screen. No period. Capital shouldn't matter to Gmail. So 
Friedlanderstan at gmail.com is probably the best way. I'm pretty, so what uh, we're gonna do, Stan, is we'll make sure the show notes have that exact email address. I'll make sure that my content team makes it really easy. So whether you're listening to this on the audio version or you're on YouTube here, you'll have access to his email. Reach out to Stan if you have questions you've tried. It's challenging to get in. You need to find a way to, to communicate with Amazon and help reframing the problem in a way that is going to be a win for Amazon and not just a, you bitching about it. Cause that's probably not going to get you very far. Listen, I'm, I always like to close the show. We talk about numbers. We talk about strategy. We'll talk about humanity here for a second. You're, you got family, you do things that are not just Amazon consulting. What's your hobby, man? Stan, what, what do you do when you're not untangling Jeff B emails and stuff like that? I'll give two things. I just moved my son into college in his first year. So I'm officially an empty nester now. And I know some folks view that as, oh, thank God. I'm not in that regard. I'm still getting very used to it as to not having noise or someone's going to give me a sarcastic joke or call me a boomer or something. And I'm not a boomer. I'm not quite that old. That's one. Two is I play baseball because I still think I'm going to wake up one day and throw a 95 mile an hour fastball. And that's likely not going to happen, but I still do play. I have several surgeries on actually strangely both shoulders. So I guess that just shows how much I throw into it. And so I still play baseball year round and I absolutely love the sport. It's amazing. So are you a Mariners fan being up there in Seattle? I went to the first game ever in the Kingdom. They lost 7 nothing to the Angels. Frank Tanana started for the Angels. Nolan Ryan won the next day, and the Mariners won on day three, which is about their record for that year. Uh, it's one and two time, times about 50. And yes, I have followed them. Uh, I remember the day that Ken Griffey was, tra- even though we, I knew he was looking to be traded and whatnot, I had to pull off the side of the road when I heard it on the news radio on my way home from work. Um, Back in the offline retail, I worked at that time. Back in the old days. Man, yeah. I used to love, so I was a kid right when King Griffey Jr. was a, a rookie. That was the heyday of the baseball card trading. So by the way, being an Atlanta Braves fan is equally infuriating as what you just described there. We did finally break through and win. My Georgia Bulldogs broke through and won a national title last year. This has been a year where Georgia's getting un... We're on our heads inflated right now, Stan. We're unnecessarily happy. So I, the, the problem with that is that there may be a crash coming here for the state of Georgia, but... Yeah, man, those were the good old days. There were so many great baseball players in the 90s. Actually, I'll tell you this. My dad, my brother, and I collected every collectible baseball card in 1993. It was our, let's do this with dad thing. And the strike happens in the spring of 1994. And we just lost complete momentum. And obviously the Braves were good for the second half of the 90s. And we enjoyed going to some games. And I still follow the Braves. My COO, my business partner, Ashley, is a fanatic. She watches every single Braves game, could probably keep the score. We asked her in a meeting the other day what the batting average of one of the players was, and she knew it. And I can honestly say I'm not that plugged in anymore right now, but I do love the game. So do you play, is this just like rec league? Is there like adult men's baseball rec league happening there in Seattle? Yeah, I know that most of the players on, they have different levels. I would say that if you use the word rec to my teammates, they'd probably get upset. No, they'd call it competitive. Okay. Uh, some of us do travel around. I would say I'm in tournaments probably two or three times a year. And it's wow. We say that, but there is a reality to, usually it's also at times when Seattle weather during the nine months of darkness, it's that's where I'm traveling somewhere else. So to play baseball. Yeah. So yeah, I do take it that seriously. No, this isn't Tyler's church league softball here. Like this is a different animal. I completely get it. Um, <laughs> I do also want to state, because I do know you're a Braves fan, as I will say the other day watching one of the greatest games I've ever seen and watching Julio hit a, a ball 117 miles an hour at a 17 degree angle and it still hit the second deck <laughs> facade. That's probably the hardest ball I've seen hit this year. And I was, or maybe ever, sorry. <laughs> But not that sorry. <laughs> no, sorry, not sorry. I completely get it, man. It's kind of like booing Russell Wilson. Eh, I respect the 10 years, but I respect but don't expect a welcome when you come back to Seattle, yeah, Russ. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Hey, final segment of each of our shows each week, Stan, is we call it the return on podcast. This is where guys like you who have been really successful in their careers tend to have some habits, some hacks, some practices personal or professional that have given them a leg up. And I'm just curious, is there anything that pops into your head that you do on a daily or weekly or monthly basis that you think gives you an unfair advantage? It's really given you a great ROI. Unfair. I, maybe this is, I don't know if I'd call this unfair because it actually creates 
an expectation that's sometimes hard to live up to, but uh, I tend to be pretty responsive. And uh, I know my old team might say that I'm overly responsive <laughs> and can tend to be 24 seven in that regard. I, if I care about what I do, I genuinely do appreciate and respect. And I loved what I did at Amazon. I really did. And I loved what I did in offline retail. I love growing businesses. And I think that as people are in their own career or in or whatever they're selling or whatnot is you should ask yourself, do you love what you do? And if you don't, how could you, if you don't find yourself constantly thinking about what can I do to grow my business or how can I solve this problem right now? So that I am that way on the flip side, strangely, and I know my wife would complain about this. I turn it off. I go to sleep. I don't, I view it as if you do what the best you could do then. And if the best isn't good enough, so be it. I'm probably not going to throw a 95 mile an hour fastball. So when I pitch this Saturday or whatnot, I will do the best I can Love it. Yeah. when you sleep at night. No, it's almost, there's an all in and then all out kind of mentality. Let me, <laughs> let, let me leave it on the field. probably would say and, that I am that way. <laughs> yeah. I think that's awesome, dude. I think that's really good. Well, thank you for that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to close this episode. Stan, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time and your insights into getting into the mind of Amazon, uh, really driving strategy here over the next uh, season. Let's call it here. I just want you to hear my gratitude. Thank you for joining us today, my friend. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. And then just in closing here, guys, Stan and I are grateful that you would hang with us for 50 minutes and listen to us rap about Amazon. This time is valuable and we hope it served you. If it has, would you share this podcast and disseminate it to your audience where Stan and I are better at talking about Amazon than we are at marketing a podcast. And so we need your help. <laughs> and with that, I think we're going to close today's show. We'll make sure that Stan's email is posted in the show notes. And until next time, I'm Tyler. This has been Return on Podcast. Take care.